Let's begin. It's about time, right on the button. And since we're studying two different books tonight, we need to get to going pretty good. Turn to the book of Joel in the Old Testament prophets. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Joel, and Micah tonight. I'll be gone the next three Wednesday nights, preaching at uh, Cleburne next Wednesday night, at Seagaville the next Wednesday night, and at Hanley the last Wednesday night of the month. And so we'll resume our study probably with Zechariah, Obadiah, the only one chapter book, and Zechariah, the longest of these books in the Minor Prophets, so called. So uh, we're trying to reacquaint ourselves with or acquaint ourselves with some passages that are not studied much and yet very valuable and notable sections of the Bible that will help us. I want to share with you about four verses in the book of Joel to highlight it, but I want to give you an overview background of the book so that when you read and study all of it on your own, uh, and even if you have before this, you'll do it with more profit after we get through discussing you'll have more or less the feel of the book, the context of the book. The thing that makes the book of Joel so unique is that a phenomena of nature is built into a spiritual lesson. I mentioned to you, if you have read National Geographic magazine through the years, at least three different times, the phenomena that Joel discusses uh, nearly eight centuries before Christ is still reoccurring in the Bible lands in uh, Judea. And that's a plague of locusts. And uh, they've even written things and shown pictures in the National Geographic through the years. I think the first was in 1917, another in 1947, and another, I think, in 73, at least those three times, they featured the very background of this book, and that is a plague of locusts. And they claim that there's nothing as devastating that when a plague of locusts comes through an area, it just levels everything. And any crops they had looked like shredded wheat on the ground. And these uh, four different types of locusts, progressively stronger, that appear in the first chapter of the uh, first two chapters of Joel, uh, probably in that day represented the four nations that overwhelmed God's people in judgment. Where it's the devastation of the physical phenomena of a locust plague, parallel with Babylon and Persia and Greece and Rome that devastated God's people and punished them uh, under the wrath of God, uh, and yet those nations were later punished for their own sins. It was how God used nations and people uh, to subdue his own people who needed to learn to repent uh, so the the purge of sin would come out of their lives and righteousness would be installed again. In fact, there's a verse that reads like that, Joel 2.25. I will restore unto you uh, that which the uh, locusts have taken. I will restore restore unto you the days the locusts have taken or the years. But uh, when the locust plague came, it was so uh, fierce, it sounded like a herd of horses. And if you would magnify locusts, uh, you could see it looks like a horse. Uh, And so they would come and uh, they would overwhelm the crops and the cattle and It'd be so devastating, it'd be worse than a drought or a famine, and there'd be no joy in the city, and children wouldn't even play or know how to laugh. There'd be no marriage, giving a marriage. It was just a very devastating time. Well, the spiritual application is God, in punishment upon his sinful people, is going to have them rue the day they turn their back upon him. And yet, if they will repent, he will restore the years the locusts have taken. I've also read that there is no way you can keep locusts out of your house. You can uh, put all kinds of protection on the outside of your house. You can seal all the windows. One fellow said while he was living over there during one of these, they sealed the house as well as a human being could, and the next day the bathtub was full of locusts. And they said also that uh, when this plague of locusts came and they would rush together and they would be swarming in such a way that they'd annihilate one another, that when it backed up uh, by the east wind, the stench was so severe you couldn't even stand it. Uh, you could put a mask over your face and everything else, and you just couldn't withstand the stench of those dead locusts. So he's describing something they were familiar with in nature, and making a spiritual application of it. 
Now, here are the verses you need to remember about the book of Joel. I've given you the historical background in parallel. 2.13, I believe, is the most outstanding verse, the most needed verse in the book of Joel. Rend your hearts and not your garments. You've heard of repenting in sackcloth and ashes all the way through the Old Testament. And a lot of them made a display of that. In Matthew chapter 6, our Lord uh, talked about the hypocrisy and pretension of the Pharisees who tried to seem pious and holy uh, on the outside, but inwardly they were a bunch of hypocrites. And so he's saying it's not enough to just rend your garments and play a little act out in the middle of the street that you're repenting. You've got to start on the inside. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Again, Titus 1.15. Unless the heart is pure, you'll never get the outside pure. So these are the lessons that they are discussing in this book. I believe that we have some parallels today. I believe we've invented something the Bible does not necessarily emphasize. I know it doesn't emphasize. And that's this, this idea of an invitation song where people come forward and we already have pre-printed cards for them to mark where they want to be restored or baptized or confess a sin or something. We've already printed the paper to help them along without confessing anything. They just have to have a pencil and that piece of paper we've already pre-printed. And if they'll just keep on coming forward every time they've done something wrong, sort of like the Catholic confession box. Uh, you cannot find the emphasis of an invitation song anywhere in the Bible. Now, am I saying that that is wrong? No, I'm saying no, it isn't necessary. And when you go into a new field, as we did in Wisconsin, and North Dakota, and Colorado, and Australia, uh, and you're starting from scratch, being in a rented hall, uh, you want to baptize everyone that understands what they're doing and want to do it, but it may be at 2 o'clock in the morning, maybe at 1030 at night, maybe at 11 a.m. Uh, in other words, it's a natural response that comes from teaching somebody. It's not the use of emotionalism and a pattern that we've invented that is essential. Uh, like, I really believe if some of my brethren had been present in Acts 8, when the Ethiopian out there in a deserted way said, here's water, what, attend to me to be baptized, they said, well, silly, you've got to wait for the invitation song. Or you've got to wait until Sunday morning, don't you? Or, or the meeting, or Mother's Day, or something like that. See, I'm talking about naturally being taught, and the person being taught stops the preacher in mid-sermon and says, I want to obey the Lord. And when you worked in new fields like I have, it's real, real refreshing to see people who are really convicted and, want, and are converted, and they want to obey the Lord, and they're not waiting for anything. I, did, I really believe we've got an emphasis that's out of order, and we think external display is the major thing. Uh, I hope you'll understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying it's wrong to have an invitation song, but if you've noticed, I prefer no more than two stanzas because the person really wants to do what's right. That's two more than they'll need. I really believe anyone convicted will just stand right up or walk right down and I won't obey the Lord. That's happened many, many times where we've established congregation in new fields. It ought to be a natural response instead of something we have imagined or dreamed up or inherited without thinking about it. And... Uh, the ultimate is for a person to be convicted of sin and won't obey the truth, and not at certain set times. It's just like people say, well, I don't really want to come forward to be restored. You don't have to. Let somebody know that you want to do what's right, and we'll take care of it. I don't read anything about coming down the aisle. I read in Billy Sunders, hit the sawdust trail denominational doctrine many years ago in America, and the old camp meetings and so forth. But I've never read that emphasis in the Bible anywhere. So he's saying to these people that knew how to get out in the middle of the street and put on a display, why don't you start on the inside and really repent? Years ago when I preached at Broadway, there was a young lady who came forward about six times a year. That was kind of her pattern. And by that's Wednesday night, Saturday night, she's a honky-tonk. And uh, here she come again. Well, one of the elders' wives, one of the most spiritual women I ever knew, came to her about the sixth time and said, Honey, why don't you just really genuinely get rid of sin and turn to God and you won't have to wear the carpet out. Well, that might have been blunt, but I'm on that lady's side. I believe she said something that ought to be said. Don't make a mockery of, uh, of your coming forward. Don't get the spotlight on you, put it on the Lord and get right with him and stay right with him. Dillard Thurman, who started the Gospel Menace, the paper I've been writing for for 40 years, 
was in his office there in Fort Worth one day, and a preacher came in and said, boy, we had a great meeting. We had 78 restorations. Dealer looked up and said, that must be a wicked church you work with. <laughs> that wasn't what the preacher was expecting, you know. Well, it's something to think about. Now, somewhere in between that is probably where we ought to be. But we ought to quit emphasizing something the Bible doesn't emphasize. Rend your hearts, not your garments. Just really mean it when you say, I'm going to be a Christian and be one. Now, some people, like Simon the Sorcerer, who sinned publicly, had to repent publicly. And he was told to, and he said, you pray for me. And the you there is plural. Acts 8, it's not singular, meaning you, Peter, pray for me. You, the congregation, pray for me. There is a biblical example of us praying for wayward, erring brethren who confess their sins. But this idea of, uh, well, one preacher got a lot of responses because he said, I know surely sometime in your life you've done something you're sorry for. And here they'd come. Here they'd flood down. Emotional response to an idiotic statement. You mean every time I've done something wrong, even in private, I've got to come forward? Here's a husband and wife that have a little argument on the way to the church house. And, and one of them comes here and says, another comes here, and they won't speak on the way home. We prayed over them, you know. We need to think about this, really. I think this is important material. And some preachers make a reputation by the real rich statements they write about how many people respond. I knew a man, I've known two or three preachers, had a little black book. They record everybody had been baptized or restored or even identified while they were preaching. I thought the Lord gave the increase. And the Lord added the church. But here's a fellow showing his boasting book. Used to have in some of the periodicals, don't have it much anymore of any. Preachers who would write in on Monday about the great day they had the day before, and they'd just brag and brag and brag, and then they'd say, to God be the glory. Well, I believe God knew what was going on. If, if any was added to the church, he added them. Preacher didn't. But this is just bombast for braggarts. Rend your hearts and not your garments. And then in 225, <laughs> he said, if you will do this, I will restore to you the years the locusts have taken. Here's a fellow who's devastated in the physical phenomena of a locust plague. He's got to rebuild. He's got to start all over. He's got to plant his crops again. He probably got to clean his house from the foundation upward and outward and through and through. So he's saying in the spiritual realm, when sin has plagued you, you may have to start all over again and clean up the whole thing, make it right. Then 314 is maybe the most uh, classical statement. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. And you know that's where everybody stands today in the valley of decision. But you shouldn't have to decide every single day if you're going to be a Christian or not. It's like a fellow went to work for a grocery store and his first job was separating the big potatoes from the little potatoes and he quit that at noon and the man said, what's wrong? He said, too many decisions. Well, uh, we need to make one decisive statement. I'm going to be a Christian the rest of my life. That's, uh, we stand in the valley of decision. Some translations say of Jehoshaphat, and that's where battles were fought and so forth. But he's simply saying, we must decide. I can't decide for you. You can't decide for me. A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. There was a fellow in the Denver area years ago, and then he came to the Dallas area for a while. And his modus operandi was to stay up with people to 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning uh, when they'd be so tired they couldn't resist anything, and he'd go duck them in water, and they wouldn't even know what happened. He'd just warn them out with about six hours of teaching. He ought to be ashamed of that. A man convinced against his will, the same opinion still. And what was the percentage of people that stuck with that kind of pseudo-conversion? Not very many. So we need to be fair with people and not overwhelm them and overrun them with pressure. Anyone who studies human psychology and uh, coercion and over-persuasion and the psychology of dealing with people could do anything he wanted to do once he builds releases their resistance force. You know, there's hardly anything I wouldn't do about 3 o'clock in the morning. I'd like to go to bed. But uh, we stand in the valley of decision, but we have to make that decision. See, I've said before thee this day, life and good and death and evil, Deuteronomy 30, 15. Choose you this day whom you will serve, Joshua 24, 15. Whosoever will, let him come, Revelation 22, 17. 
Uh, I think this is a very, very valuable point that we need to think about. In John 7, 17, the Lord said, If any man wills to do my will, he shall know if the teaching be of God. But you don't coerce someone's will to bend to something they don't even understand. We want people who want to obey the Lord, who love the opportunity to obey the Lord, not someone whose arm was twisted and then it broke. And you're not going to keep many of those people that you overwhelm with pseudo-psychology and persuasion. Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, verse 10 and 11. But how did he persuade them? With the word of God. And if a person won't be converted by the scriptures, I don't have anything else to offer them. Therefore, if I were an elder sending men out to preach in a new field, I would never ask them, how many did you baptize this year? I'd ask, how many did you teach this year? I can't cause someone to be baptized. I can teach him and give him a choice. But I don't think, the Bible didn't say go into all the world and baptize everybody. It said go teach everybody. And then baptize those who willingly turn to God and are willing to confess the name of Christ. But now let's get the major point in Joel, and that's the prophet of Pentecost. Chapter 2, verses 28 through the end of the chapter. So years ago I was reading B.H. Roberts, the Mormon historian. He's got his name in all the archives in Salt Lake City. And he was writing about how the Latter-day Revelation of Mormonism fit into the Bible, which you can't fit it in there, and he knows it. But I, you won't believe what he wrote in that, uh, in that history of the Mormon church. He said, Peter was wrong on the day of Pentecost. Well, that makes Luke wrong, because he was inspired to write what Peter said. That makes God in his word a liar. He said, Peter was wrong on the day of Pentecost when he identified the last days as beginning on Pentecost. He said, the last days didn't come until Joseph Smith from Sharon, Vermont, gave the Golden Bible, the Book of Mormon, in 1830. Well, now, I believe I'll take Peter and Luke and the Bible instead of a Mormon historian who's slanted to start with. On the day of Pentecost, Peter said what Joel said eight centuries ago is what's happening right here. And what is it? It shall come to pass in the last days. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And this was the day the Holy Spirit overwhelmed the apostles. Fulfilled Joel chapter 2. And Hebrews 1, 1 said in these last days, God speaks to us through his son. So B.H. Roberts and the Mormon church are wrong. The last days began when Joel said it would. And when Peter in Acts 2, standing up with the 11, said to that huge crowd of Jewish religionists, from every nation under heaven. God will pour out his spirit from all flesh. Peter said, this is that. This phenomena. This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And he quotes verbatim, Joel 2, 28 to 32. So what the early Bible prophets wrote, Christ and his apostles, quote. These are valuable lessons from this little book of Joel. And we learn that God means what he says and that he will punish iniquity, but he will reward those who repent and turn to him. Now let's turn to the book of Micah, which is one of the richest of all the prophets. I do not mean by this statement that Micah had no tough words, no challenging rebuke, but I call Micah the sweet prophet. I believe he had a disposition that had been tempered by living near the Philistines, the coarse, ungodly, hellish people. He lived in Moresheth, right on the edge of Philistia. And he could see the hellish ways of the Philistines. How coarse and unspiritual and shallow and carnal and mundane and secular their lives were. And he didn't want that happening to God's people. Micah and Isaiah are parallel, not only in time, seven centuries before Christ, but in the same basic message, that is the coming of the kingdom of Christ on the day of Pentecost. In fact, Isaiah 2, 1 to 4, and Micah 4, 1 to 4, cover the exact same thing. The establishment of the church of our Lord on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem on the top of the mountains when the law of the Lord went forth. And you can read Isaiah 2, 1 to 4, and Micah 4, 1 to 4, and then go read Acts chapter 2, and there it is. Every nation under heaven gathered there. 15 to 17 different nations gathered there. There were strangers from Rome, some people from the island of Crete. They came there for a Jewish feast day, and many of them left as New Testament Christians. God used that auspicious, propitious occasion, the day of Pentecost, one of the Jewish feast days, to teach them of New Testament Christianity and the end of Judaism. And they were scattered as they left there and went back to their homelands. 
Paul admitted no apostle had been in Rome, and yet the church of the Lord at Rome existed. The island of Crete was the most wicked place in the world. It and Corinth probably tied for that designation. And yet the kingdom of Christ was established in both of those outposts because of what happened on the day of Pentecost. And so when you read Micah 4, 1-4, and Isaiah 2, 1-4, to then turn to Acts 2, it's just like history written before it happened. And I want to mention one thing before we get into specifics in this seven chapter book of Micah, which is rich as cream. Big problem in this book is what verses do you leave out instead of which ones you spotlight. But it's very interesting that both Micah and Isaiah said the law of the Lord would go forth for Jerusalem. Did you know we have some brethren today in Dallas and Fort Worth that I know of and could tell you the names of the congregation that teach we're not under law today? Well, if we're not under law today, Isaiah 2 and Micah 4 have never yet been fulfilled. They said that the phenomenon that would happen and did happen on the day of Pentecost was the law of the Lord going forth. So people say, we're just under grace, we're not under law. You mean these prophecies haven't been fulfilled yet? Are you going to erase what happened on Pentecost? But analyze that we're not under law. Sin is transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. If we're not under law, we can't sin. Because sin is transgressing God's law, and we can't sin, we don't need a Savior. And so Jesus should have stayed in heaven and never come to earth and be crucified. I don't think people understand what's involved in stating we're not under law. I know why they state it. They want to live any way they want to and do what they want to do and not have any boundaries. But they deny the whole heart and soul of the Old Testament prophets in the day of Pentecost. And I can't allow that. And you can't either. Next time someone says we're not under law, we're under grace. Well, you mean we can be lawless? We are lawless without law? And how we live doesn't make any difference? And why do we have 21 New Testament books telling us how to live the Christian life if we're just under grace and not under law? I worry about people who will say to people who want to obey the law of Christ, you're a bunch of legalists. Well, I'd rather be legal than illegal. One fellow said, illegal is a sick bird. Well, that's a sick doctrine. We ought to stop and think about some of these conclusions people are drawing that's causing the New Testament church to be a farce and not needful. If the law of the Lord went forth on the day of Pentecost and Micah 4 and Isaiah 2 said it did, then we are under law. He hadn't rescind, rescinded that. Who would like to live in a land where there's no law? Why would anyone want to claim to be spiritually minded and say, but I'm not earning the law, I can do whatever I want to do. Well, if that be true, why is there a hell for people who are lawless? But if we're not under law, that's the dumbest thing anybody ever taught. But what's dumber are people who will pay attention to that and believe it. The grace of God that brings us salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us. That's what Titus 2 11 says. The grace of God teaches us. God's grace and the law of God do not conflict. It's a gracious law. It's called the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25, but it's a law. It's called the law of Christ in Galatians 6 2. Paul said, I am under law to Christ. 1 Corinthians 9, 21 and 22. It's called the law of faith in Romans 3.27. How are people going to erase those passages? They clearly teach the law of the Lord went forth from Jerusalem and we're still under that law. It's the law of faith. It's the law of liberty. It's the law of Christ. I would not want to live in a lawless society. But there's where abortion and homosexuality and all of these things have come into the American scene because enough people have taught we're not under law and God is a God of grace only. See, if their doctrine be true, there are no perimeters. It sort of reminds me of the fellow who stopped the highway patrolman. He started writing his fellow ticket. He said, you can't give me a ticket. He said, why? He said, I don't even have a driver's license. I'm not signed up with y'all. He said, well, bless your heart. Why didn't I think of that? So he takes his badge off and his billy club and lays it on the ground and says, if I had known that, hmm, all right, Micah 1.1. 1, 1. The word of the Lord that came to Micah, the Morishite, in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah, 
which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. This is really a powerful book. One of the things that we'll find in these prophets, and I believe Micah and Amos do the best job of this point, they, they speak of man's inhumanity to man. And that's the real problem we have today. Why do we have these drive-by shootings? Why do we have such uh, ungodliness and rebellion on Main Street? Why do, the, do they have the penitentiaries overflowing with people standing in line to get in there? Because of this attitude that everything is relative, nothing is definite, doesn't make any difference. And therefore, how we treat our fellow man is totally unimportant. And then those who teach evolution and atheism, that just feeds into these points we're talking about. Sunday I'm planning to preach, I think Sunday night, on why do we live in such a wicked world? We're going to analyze some of these things. See, if there is no God and there is no law, and every man's a law unto himself or a king unto himself, then what difference does it make how we live? And so the value of man is decreased. Instead of making man in God's image, we want to make God in man's image. We got everything reversed, turned upside down. And then wonder why we're in such a hectic pace of life that's hardly any life at all. Christ came to give us abundant life, but we don't want it. We want pitiful life. So man's inhumanity to man. How I treat my fellow man is unimportant. How I treat my neighbor is unimportant. Just run roughshod over them. Might makes right. That's been a philosophy of the heathen for centuries. But I want you to notice uh, in verse 2 of chapter 2. And they covet fields and take them by violence and houses and take them away. So they oppress a man in his house, even a man in his heritage. The prophets also say it. These people are so covetous, they covet the dirt on a man's head as so much real estate they could sell at market. And they will trade the poor for a pair of shoes. People, their neighbors mean nothing to them. How they treat their fellow man is zero minus zilch on God's scale. Make any difference? And we're seeing that more and more and more among men today and in our neighborhoods. But notice verse 11. Well, let's get verse 6 and then 11. Prophesy ye not, say they to them that prophesy. Thou shalt not prophesy to them that they shall not take shame. Or they don't want to hear any preaching from God. It embarrasses them. puts them to shame and they don't like that. And that's why they outcry today. Don't you old Bible bangers preach to me. We're repeating Michael's day and our day. And what's the result? Verse 11. If a man walking in the spirit in falsehood do lie, saying... I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink. He shall even be the prophet of this people. Over in Ezekiel 7, 26. You're down in bondage now, and you beg for a prophet of God, and none shall be found. For when he was in your midst, you rejected him. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests follow their example. And the people love to have it so. Jeremiah 5, 30 and 31. In this same century that Michael lived, Isaiah 30, verse 10, said the people are saying, speak to us smooth things. Tickle our ears. Don't embarrass us. Don't point us out as sinners. Well, what's the result? Notice verse 2 of chapter 3. Who hate the good and love the evil, who pluck off their skin from off them and their flesh from off their bones. In other words, they have it reversed. They hate the good and love the evil. In Amos 5, 15, we read, hate evil, love good. But they had it reversed. They loved evil and hated good. Isaiah 5, 20 says the same thing. Romans 12, 9, the New Testament said, Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. We're told to depart from iniquity. 2 Timothy 2, 19, not see how close to it we can get. I still think one of the greatest illustrations I've ever heard was the first one I ever heard a preacher give that I would have called an illustration. And I needed I needed it when he gave it. I was in high school and not doing what I ought to do. And this preacher that no one liked very well because he preached the Bible had the audacity to give an illustration that stepped on everybody's toes. It was about an ancient king that needed a new chariot driver. And three men applied for the job and he gave them all the same test. He got in the chariot and he told the first driver, you see that cliff up there? How close can you come to that without endangering my life? 
He said, about three feet. And he said, okay, drive back. Second guy said, about one foot. He said, okay, drive back. Third guy said, I'm not going to see how close. I'm going to hug the bank on the other side. I want you to live. He said, you're hired. Do we want to see how close to sin we can get? How much like the world we can be? Or hug the bank of righteousness on the other side? But here are people who love evil and hate good. I never thought I'd see the press of the United States, newspapers, radio, television, anywhere else, magazines, that have everything upside down and reversed. They applaud the shameful, sinful, hellish world and mock a Christian, a gospel preacher, the Bible. And that's what's corrupted the schools of America, the colleges. I remember years and years ago when they were having all this college rebellion, I was near the University of California, Berkeley, and uh, we'd gone to a fish place there. The local preacher said, some of the best fish in this area. And we'd gone there. It was a pretty well-known place that he was paying for. But, uh, so we went. But uh, as we were driving back, he said, here it goes again. I looked up there, and there were about 40 policemen with all this gear on his head deals, you know, and guns and everything. Around. He said, another uh, rebel act on the college campus up there. And you could see it in time. Uh, and Newsweek magazine the next week, the very picture I saw it before my eyes. It was just almost a daily occurrence. They were bombing the administration building, marching against the president, doing everything they could to disrupt a college campus. And they were counted heroes by their fellow students instead of a bunch of bums. Well, that's what's happened. We've turned things upside down. We call evil good and good evil. Micah had a tough time, and that's the reason they wound up in Babylon in captivity. They earned it. They deserved it. And they got it. But now let's read chapter 4. The messianic uh, refrain of the kingdom of the Messiah. But in the last days it shall come to pass. That the mountain of the house of the Lord. Shall be established in the top of the mountains. And it shall be exalted above the hills. And people shall flow into it. And many nations shall come. And say come. And let us go to the mountain of the Lord. In 1 Timothy 3.15 the mountain of the Lord's house, the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth, and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Notice, teach us of his ways. So it must make a difference what we believe. That old song, one doctrine is good as another. That's not what the Bible says. He'll teach us of his ways. There's a lot of difference in his ways. And the ways of men, Isaiah 55, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts and your thoughts and my ways and your ways. And they'll beat their swords into plowshares, meaning it'll be a kingdom of peace, the prince of peace with a kingdom of peace, with the gospel of peace, Romans 10, 15. In other words, the weapons of Christians' warfare are not carnal. So you don't need any swords. It's a prophetical, descriptive term that the kingdom he's talking about is a kingdom of peace led by the prince of peace. Isaiah 9, 6. And at his birth, angels said, Peace on earth among men in whom he is well pleased. Luke 2, 14. He made peace through the blood of his cross. Colossians 1, 20. He said to Pilate, My kingdom is not of this world. But some of my brethren wanted to make it a political concern and tie the church to a political platform and have brethren sign petitions that they send to their senators. We got it backwards. The kingdom we're citizens of, ultimately, the kingdom of God's dear son, is not promulgated by warfare and petitions, but by living a Christian life. I believe we've got it backwards. And one of these days, it'd be fair for the government to tax some congregations that are so politically active. That's not the realm of New Testament Christianity. That's not the nature of the kingdom of Christ. I don't believe I'm going to get this across to brethren who are so politically oriented, but I know I'm telling the truth. And I'd rather tell the truth if nobody believes it but the Lord than to shy away from it. I believe we need to stay out of government and serve Christ and his valiant army that has the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, as its weapon, Ephesians 6, 17. Because the Bible says God rules in the kingdoms of men, Daniel 4, 25. Do you believe that? That's what the Bible says. God rules in the kingdoms of men. How can I best help this nation and the world living a Christian life? Righteousness exalts a nation. Proverbs 14, 34. 
If every member of the church that is so overly politically oriented would be more spiritually oriented and be the soldier of Christ in a spiritual warfare against Satan and sin, we'd get a lot more accomplished. The nature of his kingdom was not to be a rival of Caesar, but a rival of Satan. And that's why Jesus said, I'm not a rival of Caesar. I'm not fighting the Roman Empire. I'm fighting Satan and sin. My kingdom is not of this world. Do I believe I'm going to convince everybody of that? No. I believe it surprised you if you knew the following. And all I'm mentioning is just a historical fact. You can study this out for yourself. I'm presenting what I believe based upon these passages I ought to be saying. For many, many years after the restoration movement was established in the United States of America, nearly every single preacher and nearly all of the brethren didn't vote. They didn't have insurance. They trusted God. They trusted Matthew 6, 33, that he'd take care of them if they put the kingdom first. And when James A. Garfield, a gospel preacher, ran for president of the United States, old brother David Lipscomb, editor of the Gospel Advocate in Nashville, Tennessee, came out and said, he shouldn't be doing that. He's doing a greater work as a gospel preacher. And he said, brethren, do not vote him into power. He's not taking a good stand. I realize that sounds weird and out of kilter with a lot of things today. I've been told if you're not an ardent political person, you're not a very good Christian. I have read that in the Bible, though. But anyway, when Garfield was elected president, old brother Lipscomb wrote, it's a dark day for us. And when he was assassinated, Garfield was assassinated, a lot of brethren said that's the will of God for a man who stepped out of the pulpit into the presidency. And there is a famous uh, statement made by Garfield, if he made it, some have said it's just a legend, that the first Sunday that he was president of the United States, he left a note with his cabinet who was meeting that day, I won't be here. I have a prior part appointment at the Lord's table. And then, if he made the following statement, and some say it's a legend, I stepped down from the pulpit into the presidency. You ought to get some books and read them, like Earl West's Search for the Ancient Order, and read this if you don't believe me. I'm just telling you the truth. But we have come full swing around the other way trying to make the kingdom of Christ a political, motivated, petition-ridden empire. I don't believe we have a right to be taxed, uh, released if we're going to take a political position as the church. Now what you do individually is something else that I may not could do. But I'm talking about the church getting into politics. I don't believe there's any room for that or the New Testament teaching. Micah 5, verse 2 and 3 is probably, the, well, it is the most unique thing about this book. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting to everlasting. Here's the place, the only place in the Old Testament where the place the virgin birth will take place is mentioned. Bethlehem has never been a big place. And back then it was just a tiniest dot on the map of the ancient world. Who would ever have even dreamed of saying that the virgin birth would take place in such an out-of-way, small, insignificant place? But this was seven centuries before Mary gave birth to Jesus in Bethlehem. You talk about prophecy, unique prophecy, absolutely fulfilled. Most historians say there wasn't a logical reason that Mary and Joseph were in Bethlehem anyway. May not be illogical, but there's a prophetical reason. People say, I just don't believe in the virgin birth of Christ. That's impossible. Well, Isaiah 714 said he'd be born of a virgin. And he'd be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21 to 23, that's quoted verbatim. And what Micah said and what Isaiah said came to pass in Bethlehem, born of a virgin, Emmanuel, God with us. Call him Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. Some people just have a wall-eyed fit and break out in a rash when you mention a virgin birth. Impossible, they say. Well, when you read that he's from everlasting to everlasting, has always been, how could you expect a natural birth for a supernatural person? Had to be something unique. It takes more effort for me to not believe in the virgin birth than to believe it. Someone who had always been, how could he be born any other way but supernaturally? I was asking the public debate I had with a Pentecostal preacher at my hometown of Sherman in 1974. Uh, 
what I believed about Jesus and was uh, Jesus the Son of the Father or the Holy Spirit. And they think they've got a real point there because they say the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one and the same. That's the strangest doctrine. That's the oneness, holiness, Pentecostals. And I said, is it all right for me to believe? He said, come up here and just tell me. I'll give you some of my time, Ramsey. Come up here. I said, will it be all right for me to believe what uh, the apostles believe? I said, turn to Acts 4, 26 to 29. And I said, I'm going to read to you the prayer of the apostles. They prayed to the Heavenly Father and spoke of thy holy Son, Jesus. They weren't expecting that. And I said, I believe I'll just stick with the apostles. And I probably said something after that I should. And I said, you fellas remind me of an old song I heard growing up. I'm my own grandpa. I said, you, you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all being the same. Then I turned to John 10, 30, where Jesus said, I and the Father are one. I said, you need a little grammar lesson. He didn't say, I and the Father is one. I and the Father am one. He said, are one, one in purpose. Jesus said, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's redundant if they're all three the same. They're same in power and essence, but not the same personage or personality in the Godhead. And so Paul closes 2 Corinthians by saying, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. And then we come to the real heart and crux of the book, and that's chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. You will not believe what they were saying to God. They said, oh, I, we're sinners, so I know what we need to do. We need to offer the fruit of our body for the sin of our soul. You know what they meant by that? Offer our children in the fires to the pagan deity Molech. In other words, we purge our sins by killing our children on a heathen idol. Now, you talk about the most ignorant argument human beings ever made. We'll make our lives pure by killing our children in the name of a pagan deity. He said, you misunderstand the whole thing. He has showed the old man what is good and what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. He doesn't tell you to burn your children in the fire. He tells you to bring them up in the nurture and happiness of the Lord. So you're backwards in your reasoning. It just won't work. And then verse 8, he said, He has showed the old man what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. You talk about ethics in the Old Testament as high as any ethic in the New Testament. Micah 6, 8 really sums up the gist of this book. Are we about over? Okay, I've got time for two more things in chapter 7. Better be glad we weren't studying Isaiah. It's got 66 chapters. You may have dismissed a little early. That's all right. You can come forward here in a minute. We need that invitation. Anyway. In chapter 7, verses 3 and 4, he makes the point that uh, they were so evil, they did evil with both hands earnestly. Just think about that. They couldn't get enough of sin. They were a two-fisted sinner. But at the end of the chapter, in one of the most beautiful passages in all the Bible, certainly in the Old Testament, chapter 7, verse 18 and 19, he said, Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and desires to cast our sins into the depths of the sea? God's always been merciful. You know what's interesting about that? The name Micah literally means who is a God like unto thee. So he builds his own signature into the last paragraph of the book that bears his name. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and desires to cast our sins in the depths of the sea. These are two of the richest books we'll ever study. Joel and Micah. Next three weeks we'll be gone and Paul will be teaching. And then when we come back we'll probably take uh, the smallest book, Obadiah, one chapter, and the longest one in the minor prophet, Zechariah, the priestly prophet, for our study. You've listened well. We appreciate it.